All right, guys, welcome to the live. My name is Rachel Branke. I am the head attorney and photographer over at The Law Talk, which is the page that you're hopefully sitting on. We are the legal resource for photographers. There's no other dedicated resource that has uh, the amount of information, contract templates, blog, the community, which is a many amazing members in there with years worth of information. And you guys can find hot topics such as contracts, copyright, trademark, just client issues, even down to pricing and sales and marketing. I'm actually a huge marketing fanatic and I don't talk about it nearly enough. It just doesn't fit a lot with the legal stuff, but you will hear as I talk today, I may bring up some marketing tips of how that plays in with copyright stuff. I understand that some of you may already know some of this information, but the goal of this video is kind of to give a really quick refresher. My goal is to get as much information to you and don't forget that we have the copyright guide. So thelawtog.com forward slash copyright guide. If you haven't snagged it, use the guide to follow along with the video when you want to rewatch at any time. So we are going to go ahead and just start off really quickly. I'm not trying to make this an hour long video. We want to get in it, get in and get out, but answer as many questions as we can. So copyright. I mean, you guys hear about it all the time. PPA, Professional Photographers of America, has been really pushing um, this copyright small claims type of dispute resolution. And so you've probably heard a lot of rumblings about it. You hear about clients who say they want the copyright and you're not really sure what that means or how that impacts you or how to respond. So we're gonna start with baseline what copyright is, differentiate that from trademark, going to talk about whether or not you should register your images or not, and then also what to do if you find out somebody has infringed upon your images, because it's not if it's gonna happen, it's going to be when. That is the sad state of the internet age that we are living in now. Again, if you don't know who I am, I am the brains, if you wanna call it that, more of the face over here at the Law Talk, and I also have my own law firm with a partner and we are very focused on copyright mostly intellectual property is the umbrella but copyright and trademark I just recently wrapped up a huge negotiations on the behalf of photographer with Airbnb and some very large outlets news media outlets and so that was a fun successful win we have a couple large pending ones right now but you guys can always check out the firm site at any time to see our most recent wins that is kind of my whole shtick is I am and my mission is to protect you guys, the um, smaller business photographer against these large corporate giants. But in order for us to really set you up for success from when this type of stuff happens, you guys have to have the knowledge on copyright. So you've heard about the copyright stuff, right? Copyright is an intellectual property ownership tool. There are ownership rights in a piece of intellectual property. As photographers, we're in a very unique situation than most business owners, right? All business owners have IP. I'm just gonna say IP and say intellectual property over and over. All business owners have IP. In fact, the majority of the most valuable property that any business has is their IP. But other business owners, they may just have a business name, a logo, they have photographs or media that helps to promote their business. But for us as photographers, our business is IP. We are selling photographs. Maybe you're a videographer, you also offer video services. We are selling video, okay? Oh yeah, we're selling experience, all of that, but the actual item that we are selling to our clients is intellectual property. So we're in this unique situation where we are selling IP. We're also in a very unique situation that we're in a relatively unregulated industry, right? There's not a lot of requirements for um, certain licenses or uh, uh, certifications, all of it really is reflected in the laws that are out there, such as like with copyright, such as the um, any sorts of permits or licenses you need to get locally. I think because of that is even more of a reason, combined with the fact that we're selling IP, we're selling photographs to our client, is even more of a reason that we need to understand why copyright and trademark stuff is so important. So let's differentiate the two of those real quick. 
Copyright is the intellectual property ownership tool in a IP, in a creative work, such as text, which can be a blog post, social media post. It can be in your photographs. It can be in audio, video, right? Um, and so those are the main ones for us. Like the biggest IP things that we are going to have are for copyright are going to be our logos, the text with which we are promoting our business and all the visual assets, such as our photography, video, or any other visual assets that we use. Copyright ownership in the United States, and perhaps that's where I should have started with the disclaimer, is that in the United States, we have copyright kind of on our side. Right? We're, I'm going to explain a bit here in a minute why there's still steps that we need to take, but copyright does give ownership. Copyright, let me back up for a second. We do receive, we do create the ownership of a work when we create a photograph. And I'm just going to use photograph as an example here, right? Because that is the most important thing for us. It could be your logo. It could be anything else that you're creating in the course of your business. So we do have that. However, we also have potential for an increased protection through registration with the Copyright Office. I'm going to get to that here in a little bit and why that is extremely important, especially this day and age. But keep in mind that for the most part, if you're photographing within your own business and absent any contract that signs over the intellectual property rights to someone else, or unless you're an employee of another company, you are going to be the owner of that photograph that you have taken. I'm not going to get on to all the nuances and the second level type of analysis that can occur here. So if you guys want to have a fun little intellectual debate about that, dig into the Law Talk group. I'm more than happy to discuss it. We had a really big thread a couple weeks ago about does pressing the shutter actually make you, make you the copyright holder? And there is a threshold of amount of creative process that you have to put into play. It can be as simple as posing it. It can be as simple as composing. It can be as simple as manipulating the um, the aperture and starter speed, ISO and all that sort of stuff. But if you guys want to get into a fun intellectual debate, dig into the group and we'll talk there. But generally speaking, when you take a photograph, unless you're an employee or someone else or you have signed it away contractually, you're going to be the copyright owner of that. That means you hold a bundle of rights. In law school, which here's a good thing to note here, guys, you're going to know more by the end of this video than probably your local attorney if they're not specific in IP. Business attorneys are great, but if they are not really IP specialists, they may not even know this and you can impress them next time you go in to see them. But when you're a copyright holder, you have these rights, the rights to get to uh, display, reproduce, make derivative works. You are the person that is in control or entity. Just going to say person here we're talking about just us as the photographer but you're the one get that gets the rights to control that piece of art that photograph that you've created before I go any further talking about copyright stuff I do want to just touch base on how to differentiate this from a trademark okay trademarks are protecting source indicators so it's like the connection between a logo you see and a specific product and service you see the golden arches you know that those french fries on that french fry box or the, the golden arches on the french fry box are probably coming from mcdonald's so then you know what to expect coming from there right so the golden arches are a logo but the trademark connects the connection between mcdonald's and the product or service that they're relaying now, there's also protections in a logo, such as the golden arches, by protecting the actual logo in the creative work itself, and that's what a copyright is, all right? So logos are a very interesting thing because we have both copyright and trademark at play. It just depends on what is being protected. Trademark is protecting that logo or business name as a source indicator of where the product or service is coming from, and copyright is protecting the actual item, such as the logo. All right, that is something you can throw out the next networking function. People's minds will be blown and you'll look really, really incredibly smart. But for the purposes of the rest of this video, we're just talking about copyright stuff and focus primarily on photographs. Why is this important? Why is knowing about copyright important? Well, because with the onslaught of me social media and technology, we're seeing a rise in people taking the photographs. And I don't mean you taking the photograph, I mean someone taking your photograph off the internet or you've delivered to them and they're using it in a way that you did not want it to be used or they didn't have permission to use. But we're also getting pushback from clients. And I, I don't necessarily mean this in a negative way, but we have clients that are now saying, I want to have the copyrights 
Well, now you guys can explain to them what copyright ownership really is. The majority of the time, a personal portrait client, and I'm not talking commercial stuff. Commercial is a whole other ball game when you get into headshots and product and marketing type materials. But typically speaking, a portrait session, your client is probably not going to want the copyrights. What they're wanting is just permission to be able to utilize the photographs in some form or fashion. And we ought to convey this through what's called a print release I'm not a fan of the terminology but I didn't make it up it came before me and so that's what we use on the law talk that's what our templates are identified as really to me it would make more sense to be personal use license but you guys know we got to go with what we got all right but that's how you convey it now you are gonna have clients who are gonna say they want to own it there may be re for personal reasons that's cool if they want to have copyright ownership and you the photographer are comfortable with that that's okay just go back to what we were talking about all of those rights that you have when you license you're just extending and I think of it this way we were taught this in law school that it's called a bundle of sticks it's a bundle of rights and each stick visually represents a different right when you are extending to a client to a license you're extending a certain number of those sticks depending on what language is in that license or print release and you may also make it so you can take the sticks back it all depends on the language right it doesn't mean that they have ownership over that they just may have permission you might just have part of it stick maybe a little tiny twig of the stick right they don't get the whole bundle that is what the copyright holder gets to hold and those are the rights that they have but think about this when you convey copyright ownership and this is a big hot topic in our industry you're gonna see all variations of um, of opinions on this pushback on this debates I'm kind of in the camp that whatever suits you best for your business is what's best just make sure you do it the proper legal way through proper documentation whether you do copyright where you're giving over all the rights in giving over ie selling hopefully to somebody else do it right by contract right or if you're just licensing it making sure you're using either commercial licenses or print releases that are drafted to your needs and your desires for your business so wherever you fall on the scale that is what you need to stand behind and make a decision you don't necessarily have to conform with industry standards that is one of the beauties of being a business owner we can make a decision how much whether we want to sell copyright and how much of a license that we want to convey if we don't want to transfer that copyright over keeping in mind and guys I see this all the time especially if you're dealing with large maybe you are doing commercial work in large companies or you have extremely savvy clients and they want the copyrights make sure you're comfortable with that negotiations on the commercial side are super popular Typically, on the portrait side, you're probably not going to see it as common. It's more of a misuse of the words. They think copyright equals getting to reproduce. When I mean, you can license that, you guys know that now with the print release that you can do that. How you feel about ownership of the photograph is what makes the most sense for your business is what you need to stand behind. I do want to give you guys an example here though. It is going to be a commercial one, but you can also use it in the context of any type of uh, photography that you're doing. It's something for you to think about when you're trying to decide, do I want to have copyright ownership or not over a photograph? And this may be especially important if you're the person in the photograph, okay? And I'm bringing this to you kind of in a reverse light so that us as photographers can maybe better understand when people are actually asking for copyrights, why that is all right let's say I'm going to hire a photographer down the street to take some photographs for me to use on my website my podcast in the law talk and it by default they're not an employee of my business and by default that photographer decides they want to retain the copyrights of course I as the client have to make that decision if I want her to keep the copyrights or him but it's probably um, whoever it's going to be I have to make that decision also as the client here are two examples of why this is important for us to understand okay if I am the client and the photographer retains the copyright of the photograph they have all those rights that they're keeping but let's say you know and I'm using the photos on my website and promoting my business or maybe it's just of my family and it's all of my children because I have like 500 of them that keep showing up I don't know how it happens somebody can PM me later and let me know <laughs> I have five uh, it just feels like 500 between them and the two dogs also but 
if I don't have any copyrights in the photographs that I'm in, and let's say that a third party goes and takes that photograph and sticks them on a billboard, Pottery Barn decides to advertise their new crib, or um, Royal Caribbean decides to slap it on the side of a cruise ship, I as the copy, I as the client am not the copyright holder in this first scenario. I have no rights to stop these other companies, large corporations, from taking the photograph and utilizing it. Probably have an argument for publicity rights, but from a copyright perspective, I have no ownership in it as the client. The photographer under this scenario is retaining it. In the same way, I, if I am using, if this, it could be either for commercial portrait. This situation goes either way because it's all about IP rights and who owns it. So I'm the client. I only have the rights to license and use it for myself. And the, client, the photographer retains the copyright ownership. This cruise line smacked my image up on the side of their cruise ship. I have no copyright rights. I don't have any of those sticks to stand on. I have nothing. I have to depend on that photographer to decide to pursue Royal Caribbean or whoever it is. Let me probably not put Royal Caribbean. That's the first thing that came to my mind because I saw their advertisement earlier. Um, it could be any large corporation, right? I have to depend on that photographer to enforce the rights and really defend that photograph and get it taken down excluding any publicity right stuff that I may have. Let's look at scenario number two. Those images are super valuable to me if I'm utilizing them as headshots or I'm a very private individual and I don't want those photographs being splashed up anywhere else except for maybe on my photographer's website, okay? Photographer photographs, photographer conveys copyright ownership to me. I license back to a photographer that they can utilize it on their website. All of a sudden we see it on the side of a 18 wheeler going down I-95. Then I don't have to rely necessarily on the photographer in order to pursue to get that photograph taken down because guess what? That bundle of sticks was conveyed to me as the client and then I can enforce it. I hope that these two scenarios kind of give you guys some ideas when A, you're getting photographs done for your own business so you can make the determination on who's going to retain copyright ownership versus a license. And then also what your clients might be going through if they're savvy enough to understand how these situations can come into play. I present these to you at this list last bit to answer the question of should we convey copyrights or not because it's going to depend on your clients, going to depend on your business. That might be a little confusing. Quick recap. Scenario number one, photographer re retain copyright, image gets stolen and is infringed upon. I, as the client, don't have much recourse copyright-wise in order to get it taken down. Scenario two, copyright was conveyed from photographer to me as client, then I, as client, then can enforce because I'm now that stickholder, that owner of that photograph, I can have it taken down. And I might want to have control for my brand control or for personal privacy reasons if it's a personal situation, personal photograph, okay? Now, Let's go to the next level. We know that infringement happens. It happens all the time. And this is the number one thing that we are doing at the law firm. And it drives me crazy because I wouldn't walk into Target and pick up something and just walk out and not pay for it. But that is what's happening with intellectual property these days. And this next part of what I'm talking about infringement, I'm not necessarily talking about when people use the share function on Facebook of sharing it like from your page to another. I'm talking about the straight up taking it from a photograph and putting it on to um, their website, their social media, any commercial based feed. I always ask myself, what is the end goal of the platform where this party has shared this photograph to? Because there are exclusions under copyright law. You guys have heard about fair use and you guys can go read the article. I'm not gonna dig into all the fair use exceptions here, but if I just see someone utilizing a photograph on a personal profile page on Facebook of theirs, there's no commercial nature to it, I might be able to have Facebook get it taken down under DMCA or some other takedown notice, but I'm probably not gonna have a copyright infringement claim against them. It's primarily when people are utilizing it on a platform with a commercial nature to it. It doesn't mean that they have to be selling the photograph. It doesn't necessarily mean that the photograph has to have a call to action for you to buy their product or service. It is being on like a commercial feed is low enough of a threshold to be infringement, all right? But before we get into the infringement stuff, let's talk a bit about the 
registration to register or not to register. And this question is actually why I really wanted to do this video because this is one of the top questions that we get in the group of the Law Talk group, but also impacts when you guys come to me at the firm because you're coming to me because you know I against, go against corporate giants, you know I eat them for breakfast and love to defend you guys, but it's hard for me to go against a large co corporation or company when you don't have registration behind you. And let me explain the difference in why this matters all right so like we've already established you take a photograph you're not a contractor I'm sorry back, scratch that you're not an employee of a company taking it this is of your own business um, and you take this photograph it let's just say here it is yours we're gonna come up with all these different exceptions this is not a life school exam this is not the bar exam but you own the copyrights to that photograph when you take it you have it you have the rights but you only if someone infringes you only have the potential really for actual damages what does this mean and this can be good and bad typically though not having a registration puts you in a weak position actual damages means you have to when you're going to make a claim against someone and we're going to talk about later what this means this can be all the way up to suing them this could be a demand letter i'll give you guys the gamut of options that you can use when you find out that your um photograph has been infringed upon stolen and used actual damages it's the damage to your business which may be zero and maybe any way that that company has profited which may be zero in the inverse it could also be a lot we don't know right so actual damage though is a, actually a fairly weak position to be in and this is where the majority of photographers are sitting now because so many don't understand that you need to register your photographs and I'm gonna talk about that here in a second uh, so don't jump into the comments and be like no you don't no you don't I'm gonna explain to you my opinion why you should do it and I'm gonna also tell you the benefits the drawbacks and you guys can decide if you want to implement it in your business or not the way that I look at it is our system in the United States for copyright is completely deficient right now yes PPA and all of them are trying to pass and we just had new movement on getting a small claim style dispute resolution at the copyright office I have my own opinions about that I'm gonna reserve it for this video because my heart will start going through the roof and we just don't need it'll just muddle all of this conversation but as of now we the record there's not a lot of recourses other than sending demand letters take down notices and then potentially pressing a lawsuit against someone when they take your image and infringe upon it these days and the unfortunate thing is when you have a unregistered photograph it's an uphill battle I see this all the time someone comes into the firm a large corporation has taken their image and it's wrong it's straight up wrong they are in the wrong but I get countered from all of these large corporate attorneys who are always like, well, it's not registered. Show me your registration. And I can make creative arguments back, but here are some of the downfalls. One, you don't have statutory damages to hold over someone's head, which I'll explain to you here in a minute and how it contrasts from actual what we just talked about. Two, to actually be able to file a federal lawsuit against the company under the copyright laws, you're going to have to have a registration anyways. All right. And also registration is what's called prima facie evidence of ownership of the photograph. Now I've countered all of these successfully to large companies, but it just adds one more layer of time of things that you're trying to explain in an uphill battle in order to defend our IP, defend our photograph. It sucks, but it is what we is. And we got to work with what we've got now. So we just go with it. So you take the photograph, gets infringed upon, you haven't registered, you're only looking at actual damages. You're also looking at having a potential to then register your photograph anyways because you need it in order to um, cut off all the things that I just talked about, the arguments. But here's the thing, and this is the tricky part if you get nothing else from this entire video. Registering your photographs is a very low cost way to safeguard yourself. I consider it kind of like car insurance, all right? You can't just take a photograph, publish it, put it out there, it get infringed, and then you go, oh crud, I now want to get um, paid for this. I want to get really paid for this. Well, if actual damages is zero benefit to them, zero harm to you, what are the actual damages? Relatively zero. Under statutory damages, generally speaking, and there's a whole, there's arguments either way, and don't hinge on these numbers, I'm gonna say, it can be up to $150,000 per image plus attorney's fees. That attorney's fees aspect is a huge thing when you guys have an infringement claim because then 
you're not necessarily having to just pay out all the attorney's fees yourself. I don't want the attorneys to just win. That's kind of the whole point of this. Even though I'm an attorney myself, I don't just want the attorneys to win. I want you guys to win. So I'm encouraging you guys to get into the process of registering your photographs. Because here's the thing. You can't wait until the image gets infringed, then register it, and then say, I want the statutory damages, and I want to claim up to $150,000. It's up to. It's not a guaranteed $150,000, right? Like I said, car insurance. You can't drive around all the time, then get into a car accident, call up Geico, and say, yo, Geico, I was just in a car accident. Can you cover it? Doesn't work that way, right? Um, insur insurance is probably not the best word, but that's a great analogy, you know, I think. For this for you guys to understand so the formula goes this you should register your photograph prior to infringement in order to fall under this hundred fifty thousand dollars statutory damages plus attorney's fees threat that you can have and when I say threats because we can use it in a letter or we can use it in a lawsuit um, now the formula for this though there is a grace period so once you publish your photograph, and don't let the term publish be um, confusing for you. I wish they were, I wish they used the term like access, because it's the first time it really becomes accessible to other people. Okay, publishing can be you delivering through a shoe proof gallery to your client. It can be posting on social media, okay? There's a variety of ways, but it really is all about access to when other people had access to the photographs, okay? So from that date, you have three months to register. There's kind of a grace period. So let's say you shoot a wedding, you post it on your blog, um, you should, let's say, what, what month are we in? July. So you po you shot a wedding July 4th. You post it on your blog July 10th. And then you all of a sudden see that someone's infringing like July 20th. Well, the three month grace period for getting to register your photograph started from publication on July 10th. So you have three months from then, you can go do registration, even though it's after the infringement. Typically infringements align in the sand unless you're within this three month grace period from the first date of the publication, this access by other parties, okay? That allows you to be able to stand up to this large corporation and instead of saying, of what actual damages, oh no, you know, I only really have a licensing rate, but I don't have any justification because I've never really licensed it to anybody. And the Getty Images calculator sucks. I'm gonna talk about that all here in a second. I'm not gonna make this too long for you guys, but this is really important. Now, all of that, all of that whole hullabaloo about justifying your pricing, telling them where you got the licensing amount from, comes from, blah, 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 all that relatively comes off the table when you have this huge statutory damages threat over someone's head, all right? I went off a little rabbit trail there. Let's get back. Actual damages when it's unregistered. Once you register, you have the statutory damages protection for the photographs after. However, you have a three-month grace period from when the image is first published in order to register it and still fall under statutory damages even if your registration comes after the infringement. Here, next level though, you're probably sitting there and you're thinking, I have photographs that are four years old that I've never registered. You can go register them now and you still get out protection for statutory damages for infringing acts that occur from now forward, okay? So don't think that you just have to do with it in the three months. That three month is like a grace period if there's an infringement that predates the registration, okay? That three month grace period is a, is a is the three month period is a grace period that if you find infringement prior to registration, you still can have the benefit of statutory damages, right? So if you're sitting here thinking, oh man, I got stuff I haven't registered, I should get registered, yes you should. Yes, you definitely should. And, and we're gonna talk about this here in a second, but if you find that your images have been um, infringed upon, I still think that you should register them if you haven't already. Why? Because, when someone infringes, they're showing value in your photograph. I know it's kind of like a backwards way to look at it. You're actually thinking, no, they're devaluing me because they're stealing my photograph and they're using it for their own gain. Yes, but there's value. It's the whole mindset of when a client shows you who they are, believe them. <laughs> Same thing, when someone shows you that an image is valuable, do it. Uh, we actually just shared about this over on the firm when we went up against um, Airbnb. We had a situation where we started with unregistered images. We registered them, and uh, and then we found new infringement that occurred after that. And so it changed the entire argument from an actual damages to statutory damages, and it increased the demand of what we could ask for from them. 
Okay. So you guys can read more about that at connorsandbranky.com if you want to read the whole release, press release about it. But just to know that registration is important. I strongly recommend that you guys are putting this into your workflow. Don't quote me on these prices, but we're looking at like 60, 70, 80 bucks for photographs. You can do collections of up to 750 images for relatively low cost. And if you guys are sticking it into your cost of doing business, then why are we not doing it? Again, it's like insurance, you know, because here's the thing, and I've said it already in this video, so many of you will come to me, and I love that you come to me, I love to help, but I just hate my response. When you don't have a registered photograph, there are things that we can do, it just makes it a more lengthy and costly process, because we don't have the strong arm of saying to a company, well, pay our um, demand, or we're gonna see you, because they're gonna go, you don't even have a registration, you gotta do that first. You know, they're, or they're, you don't even have a statutory damages to hold over us, and they play games and it sucks, but it is the landscape of the copyright laws and how we, what we've got to deal with now. So I'm strongly, strongly recommending that you guys get copyright registration under your belt and into your workflow. Um, every two to three months, we'll capture you. It will get you in there, and it's a good workflow process, and it can be relatively easy to do. Copyright.gov is the copyright office that you guys can do that at. It is a government website, and it does suck. Sorry, copyright officials, if you guys are watching, your website needs improved. We are in 2019, um, and it is like way back in the old school. So just be patient with it, but definitely do it. Um, and you can always reach out. Our firm or any other intellectual property attorney can help you, but the registrations are fairly straightforward. Just make sure you do it right, because we are finding issues where people have registered them on their own, they did it wrong, and then when they try to enforce it, people like me are able to pick apart and say this registration is actually invalid for X, Y, and Z. And you just don't want that. You don't want to lose any of that protections that you think you had. Yeah, in that situation, it's like having an insurance policy you think that covers you, but it actually doesn't. So make sure that you are registering, put it on a simple workflow for you to be able to integrate and do it, and do it. I mean, like, there's nothing more I can say about that. There's a huge difference between having actual damages and then having a statutory damages threat to hold over someone. You know, and one thing I didn't even mention, and we can go ahead and move in now, what do we do if we find that someone's infringed upon our photographs? And it's, we've had companies that just ignore, because what they're doing is calling your bluff at that point. They just ignore your letters. They ignore your demands, because if you don't have a registration, they're basically looking at it from a cost, um, cost benefit analysis. In their mind, if they're, especially if they're a large company, and I use large company because that's typically the landscape of what I'm working with, and it can even happen from smaller mom and pop companies who are ripping it off simply because they don't know, which is not a defense, but you know, um, ignorance of the law is not a defense, but people are doing it every day, and that's why the law talk is here and I hope you guys share this video and share as much information as you can to help elevate our industry and educate other business owners because in the landscape of our copyright laws it does become very costly for us it does become very administratively burdensome and the more we educate the more hopefully we'll be able to reduce these issues but what you're looking at is when you find this happen from large corporations they're able to say kick rocks you don't have a registration bye challenge us go get your registration and then try to sue me under actual damages you're gonna look at it also you're gonna sit down and go the only people that win are the attorneys it's not worth it and that sucks that is not a good place to be in how can you hedge that off registering the photographs okay so let's get to infringement and then we will kind of semi wrap this thing up since this is a lot of information I went a bit longer than I expected for you guys but when you find that someone has infringed upon your image, you have to first look at who it was. Typically, it's not actually someone that we're in contract privity with. What I find is it's not often that someone's deviated from her license. Maybe they did. Maybe they altered the photograph. They're using it in a different capacity than they were supposed to. That is, man, this is not scientific data, but for us, that's probably less than 10% of the cases that we see. 90% is this external third party who you have never had any relationship with just snagged it or they had an agency, media agency that they hired that just snagged it. They have an in-house intern, rogue intern, like I've been told before, what's a rogue intern, whatever, that has snagged the photograph and use it. It still makes that company liable. What do you do in those situations? Well, you identify who it is because um, if it's a client and you have contracts in place, you have contracts going on, you have copyright to help you, 
you probably quickly tie that up fairly quickly. I'm gonna focus primarily on what I see most often, and this is these companies that just take it, you have no relationship with, you have a spectrum of things that you can do, all right? So you can start with simply reaching out to the host, the ISP, Facebook, social media, whatever social media platform it is, and submitting what's called a takedown notice or a DMCA. DMCA is just a acronym for Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it outlines uh, what you can do to assert your intellectual property rights in certain IP and a request to have it taken down. Now, the problem with takedown notices is the the let's let's just say it's Facebook, right? Say I send a takedown notice to Facebook because I found somebody was infringing. That somebody's not Facebook. It's just someone other user on Facebook that is using my image commercially, and I'm the copyright holder to it. The downfall with sending takedown notices, and we see this really often with YouTube, is that you assert it, they get it taken down. They being Facebook takes down the photograph. Well, what they do is then they communicate to the per the infringer, and they say well, we took it down because of X, Y, and Z, that infringer can turn around and go, no, I actually have the rights to it and get it put back up. Then that's the end of the line for DMCA. So that's the end of the line for the takedown stuff, right? As long as you have followed the, the DMCA and filled out the takedown form properly or sent a proper one and they conform, it conforms with the law and Facebook or whoever it is, YouTube, takes it down, puts it back up, that's the end of the road. They cannot play judge and jury because if they play judge and jury on who is the IP rights holder, even though I know Facebook does it all the time, Zuckerberg, please don't believe me for saying this. Um, your bots do it, your admins do it, it sucks, but it happens. Uh, if they play judge and jury, they can be implicated in infringement. So typically what happens, it gets taken down, it gets put back up because the infringer counters and says, no, we actually have the rights. Well, then you're stuck going like this. Well, now I'm gonna figure out what's the next step. So what you can do is a letter. I'm not a fan of if you're actually going to pursue a photograph for infringement, whether you're going to do a demand or you're actually going to get to a lawsuit at some point, I don't recommend doing the takedown notices first without consulting an attorney, an IP attorney, because you want to do as much evidence gathering as possible, and perhaps that's what I should have said first. Please don't run to the law talk and start posting about it and tagging that third party. You're going to damage your claim. Please don't run around and start leaving reviews and all of that. You want to evidence gather first, because if you see some little infringement happening, you're probably going to see it other places because most of the companies will snag a photograph and they'll utilize it on a website and also their social media platforms or vice versa. You don't want to run to do a take down notice or start talking about it or commenting on it and then lose all the other evidence that you could have had. All right. So evidence gathering before you do anything, not a fan of takedowns unless you're absolutely not going to do anything else and it's really the only way that you want to try to get it taken down but if it goes back up then you got to consider do I want to do a letter with the demand and the demand is what's going to come into play whether or not you have registration or not you can send actual damages letter you can send unregistered copyright demand letters to people and you can get paid we do it all the time at the firm all the time because that's what you guys are coming to us with we're willing to do it for you I'll also tell you if it's not worth your money not many lawyers are that honest so I am or else I'm just a really crappy salesperson. Uh, but you have to look at it from a cost-benefit analysis if you're going to be able to get back what you're going to expend in order to do it. Obviously, that pill is easier to swallow if you have a registration. Again, letters. You can engage what's in called letter writing campaigns. You can reach out to companies, you know, assert your intellectual property rights in the IP, make a demand. You can get into negotiations with them. They'll either negotiate or they'll tell you to kick rocks. It happens. Those are the two, or they won't say anything at all. They'll just ignore you. And then you're stuck if you don't reach a solution going, well, now what do I do? Then you have to consider if you want to do a federal copyright suit. Some situations, if you have a registered photograph or even an unregistered one, but it's a really, really good um, circumstance, you have really good facts in your favor, you may jump to lawsuit. I'm not a big fan of jumping to lawsuit just because you can, even if you have a registration. Let's still sit back and see what we can do. Um, the majority of times, though, even if you do file a federal lawsuit, from my experience, they end up getting settled. Um, and actually, you end up getting in um, judge or uh, managed mediation anyways in federal court. And so most of it ends up getting um, settled anyways prior to an actual full trial, unless it's like a really killer image and very peculiar set of circumstances. But here, let me give you guys some numbers, and then we're going to quickly wrap this up. If you are really going to guns blaze, want to go for somebody and you really want to go to court, you need to have a registration because it can cost you twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars in order to defend in order to initiate and carry through a full copyright infringement suit. 
And you're, you're probably sitting there going, oh, well, I'm never going to go that. You never know. You never know who's going to take the photograph. You never know what the situation's going to be. But I'm telling you, if you have the registration from the very beginning, you can utilize the registration and take down notices. Do you know that? You can attach that to show that you're the IP rights. You can utilize it to attach to letter writing. And you're going to get a better response quicker when you have a registration. I can't guarantee results, blah, blah, blah. I'll disclaim all that kind of stuff. But for me, the way that I look at it is, guys, it's not... If it's going to happen, it's when it happens all the time, and it's third-party stuff. The reason I bring the big third-party example, not just because it's what we see most commonly, but because the biggest pushback that I often get from you guys is saying, well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to initiate against anything against my clients. I'll never sue my clients. It's not often your clients that are doing it. More often than not, it's not them. All right? So we've gone over what is copyright. We've gone over who owns the copyright. We've gone over uh, what to do if someone's infringing. Um, we've gone over negotiating of copyright ownership or conveyance of that. Um, I want you guys to take the time and to dig into this. I hope you're taking notes. I hope you're running through and just be able to make the best decisions you can for your business. We are more than happy to do uh, consults at the firm because it's federal work. We can work anywhere and we have bunch of networks of attorneys that work with us in different states. So we're more than happy to reach out to you guys. We have a bunch of resources on the Law Talk as well. A lot of what I talked about here was in articles, but it's hard for me to really, if you see how long this video is, it's hard to really give a comprehensive view. And this isn't even everything. This is just like not even basic. You can learn a lot of good information here, I hope, but you are definitely going to get more out of it video-wise than on um, text in the blog post, or else they'd be like a bazillion pages long. So just please make sure that you guys are going to run through and put registration into your workflow. Get yourself prepared if it's ever going to happen. I strongly recommend that you sit and even maybe you're in a position that you're brand new in business and you're not really sure what you're going to do uh, for uh, if this happens. Make sure, though, you're prepared for when it's time. Once you get all your other legal stuff under your belt, then make this kind of second level thing that you want to integrate into your business. You know, there's some large um, educators in the industry that I've had this exact discussion with, and a lot of them are like, no, I don't care about copyright. But guess what? They've been in my inbox, and I'm having to tell them, well, we only have actual damage at this point. We have an unregistered photograph. Here's the weaknesses. Um, and again, like I said, it doesn't mean that you can't pursue it. doesn't mean you can't get it taken down. doesn't mean that you can't get paid. But when you don't have registered images, there's not really such thing as a payday. You have to have a really unique set of circumstances. And I see this said all the time in the group and in uh, our inquiry. I want my payday because it's a large corporation. It's not even about how deep their pockets are. In fact, I find that mom and pop companies who infringe are probably more likely to comply because they are looking at it from a cost-benefit analysis. Do I pay all this to the attorneys or I just pay this company to go or this photographer to go away? Um, it's really the larger companies, even though they're the ones with the deep pockets, they're the ones that actually end up stonewalling because guess what? They have an attorney on staff. That attorney is making the same amount of money whether they're working or they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs and watching cat videos on YouTube during the day, right? They're paying them the same amount of money if they're an in-house counsel. So just keep that in mind. Now, get out of this mindset of it's a payday, especially if you haven't done anything that's going to set you up to be able to make sure that you have the strongest argument possible. So again, make sure you guys have the copyright guide, go back through it, dig into the Law Talk group. We're more than happy to help answer questions um, in there as well. Follow-ups to this. My admin team is phenomenal. Um, they can in through the chat, can also help you guys find further resources. And please, please, please make sure that you share this with other photographer friends so that we can set everyone up for success in the photography business.